Hi, I'm Jeff Scoop with Beyond Barriers. This is my co-host, Acacia Dietz, and our special guests this evening are Mr. Duke Schneider and his wonderful wife, Catherine Schneider. Uh, welcome to the program, Duke and Catherine. You're welcome. Well, Thank we you. do appreciate the invitation, and uh, it's always good to see and hear from you, Jeff. Likewise, my friends. Um, you guys have a really interesting story. Duke, um, well, I should preface this by saying Duke is one of our uh, volunteers on the Beyond Barriers team and uh, a, a man that I've known for many, many years uh, and um, very good friends, friends, Duke and Catherine. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your uh, history first? I, you were involved in the National Socialist Movement and then um, forward from that, what, what you're doing now and all that. Mm -hmm. Well, the, there's an old saying, Jeff, and that, that, that saying is that everything that you do in life is a learning experience. And as a member of the National Socialist uh, Movement, uh, my, my entire goal, my aim was basically for the betterment of uh, our country when you come right down to it. That's why I got involved and that's why I stayed with it. As you know, I made a lot of... Um, changes as uh, I was moved up the ladder and moved rather rapidly at that, changes for the better. When I resigned seven years later, as a result of um, a bout with uh, thyroid cancer, uh, at least I had the satisfaction of seeing our stormtroopers working alongside law enforcement and giving aid to a lot of the um, Mexicans who were stranded in the deserts uh, down around the uh, California and uh, Arizona as well. They were re they were rendering assistance, which was something that, would, that the public would never expect. And at least we both jointly have the satisfaction of knowing that we've taken something bad and turned it into something positive. And I, I confess, I'm proud of that. Uh, fortunately, when I, uh, when I was diagnosed, everything I had crumbled just like a house of cards because I realized my own vulnerability. You know, when you realize, you know, when, when, when you come face to face with your own mortality, it makes your mind work a different way. And I was definitely anticipating death. Fortunately, Catherine was very instrumental in uh, keeping that from happening. She kept, uh, she, kept me, uh, she kept me sane, calm, normal, and she gave me the satisfaction of uh, not only uh, companionship, but for the first time in my life, I actually experienced uh, somebody uh, who loved, who, who was giving me love with, you know, un unconditionally. And that was also very instrumental in, uh, bring, in bringing me uh, deep, you know, deep into uh, religion, which was something that I had never uh, experienced uh, before. You know, as you know, you know, needless to say, Jeff, you're an old buddy. And uh, I know that uh, <laughs> you're very discreet with what you say. So, so you were, so you were always very discreet, and uh, not saying that I was a that I was a thick-skulled, hard-headed Dutchman, which of course that's exactly what I have always been, and I've always been the one who'd say, "I'll believe it when I see it." Well, when I saw a miracle actually happening, that was enough to that was enough to convince me, and uh, like I say, I got Catherine to thank for an awful lot of this because uh, she really. Uh, you know, she really, she really kept me on the path of sanity with all of that going on, and she was with me all the way. And it's funny, you know, how still water can run so deep. All this time, I'm working as a bodyguard, just simply rendering protection, things of that nature, and uh, not paying very much attention to anything else. I had to have her tell me the day I went in for surgery that she was in love with me. And when I asked her when, when she came to that discovery, she told me, the day I hired you. I said to myself, you know something? I got I to gotta come out of this alive now. <laughs> I definitely got to live through this. And when I came through it, that's when I told her. You know, I, I held her hand in the recovery room and I said, you know something? Just as soon as I get my strength back, I'm going to marry you. <laughs> we got married 25 days later. That's awesome. You know, and I've heard this story, you know, a bunch of times because, you know, we go way back, you know, you and I, but uh, it never gets old. It, it is such, it's such a, a wonderful story. And Catherine, I wanted to ask you too, you know, what did you, when you met Duke, when you first met him, he was still involved in the movement and, and uh, you, you still, you stuck by him and, and you were. Yes, that's right. Cause he, 
I know he was a good man. Well, well Jeff, uh, I wasn't in the movement at the time when we had gotten together. What happened was it was back in 2002 where uh, she was looking for uh, personal protection because of a, um, you know, a, a previous uh, relationship that she was running from. And, yeah, uh, my, my ex-husband. And, and he, he was very abusive, so I needed protection. And also, I was signing autographs in New Jersey, and I had a stalker follow me around the whole show every day. So I had the highest in my 24-7. I mean, this guy was a real pervert. But uh, nevertheless, um, he, um, you know, I had a little talk with him, and uh, he uh, did a vanishing act. He hasn't materialized since. <laughs> uh, getting back with it all, uh, I undertook her um, protection in 2002. I didn't get involved in the movement until 2005. And despite it all, you know, now, now I'm burning a candle at uh, three ends, my, uh, my line of employment. Catherine's protection, and now my involvement with the movement kept me pretty busy. Uh, but nevertheless, she, um, she, just, she just hung right in there. She never, she never quit, never gave up, never lost hope. And as we can see, she won out at the very end. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to ask too, because uh, uh, I know I, I didn't ask all the background questions, but both of you have pretty interesting backgrounds. Like Catherine, you had just mentioned you were signing autographs. So, so for the listening audience, I, I already know, but for the listening audience and the viewing audience, why were you signing autographs? Could you tell us a little bit about that? You were in movies. Oh yeah, I was in um, movies and entertainment. Horror movies and comedies. Plus, you also a talk show host. I was a talk show host for Starfire yeah. Entertainment. That was how, as a matter of fact, Jeff, that was how we met because she was conducting interviews at uh, the Big, and the Big Apple uh, comic book convention mm -hmm. where um, where I was signing autographs. Uh, you know, being you know being a, you know, a former pro wrestler, you know, well that uh, that's the, that <laughs> basically made me uh, famous in a way. That so uh, we question. met. <laughs> Thank you. We met. We met uh, when she interviewed me for the Starfire Entertainment show, and it was some time later that uh, she asked me if uh, she could hire me for personal protection. I've been a bodyguard many uh, times, uh, Jeff. Many times. Um, I've uh, I've got I've got twenty years in law enforcement. Retired. Uh, with uh, full de decorations, never a disciplinary charge, never any uh, type of uh, anything questionable about my uh, history as a as a lawman, and uh, I've been involved in uh, armed uh, private uh, security ever since. And it's uh, it's a good it's a good way to make a living if you work for a good company. And uh, I've just about done every phase of um, uh, private uh, protection. So uh, being, uh, you know, being a bodyguard to a, a woman who's involved in entertainment uh, definitely came as a, it was a second nature, basically. Is uh, most guys, well, as long as they know what side of the line they belong on and they don't step over, uh, don't step over their bounds and they remain uh, with a professional demeanor, there wouldn't be any problem. Uh, Catherine, I have to confess, was... Um, she was trying to throw a wrench into that uh, China closet because she was doing everything she could to be extremely nice to me. And mm -hmm. all I was doing was being extremely professional with her. Mm -hmm. And when I joined the movement, I had to be even more professional because we, we had guidelines that we had to follow. Mm -hmm. We had a protocol. So I did my job thoroughly, but nevertheless, I also knew what side of the barrier I belonged on. In 2012, when they diagnosed me with thyroid cancer, that was it. There were no barriers. The walls just collapsed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I almost collapsed right, 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 right along with it because uh, I got to confess, Jeff, you know me. You know what we've been through. Bordentown, L.A., when your life was threatened, things of that nature. Back in the our Washington, D.C. rally, again, where, where your life was threatened, it it. Didn't, it didn't phase me to be your shield. Dying by violence never frightened me at all. But when they said cancer, I found out that through everything I'd been through, I was nothing but a coward after all, because it was the most frightening experience I ever had. And yes, it, it did in fact turn, turn my life around. 
Wow. It turned. It looks like it turned your life around for the better, though. You made some, <laughs> some big changes, met an incredible woman in the process, and and mm -hmm. uh, it, it's it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And you well, know, I want I want to bring something else up too that uh, I think people will find interesting. I don't think we explained it clearly, but Duke was the chief of security in the National Socialist Movement. Um, so um, that security background was put to use by the organization back in those days as well. But there's another thing that uh, from our history, our past history, that I wanted to bring up that I think is really interesting um, for a lot of people. When you were still involved in the movement, um, you had. Um, I'll let you explain it because you, you explained it better, but I remember you talking about it when we were in St. Louis in, I think it was 2009, um, about what uh, the, the bone marrow, uh, the bone marrow issue. Do you remember that? I certainly do. I mean, every, every time I touch my sternum, I remember it. <laughs> okay. Basically what that all came right down to was a uh, situation with a, um, a, you know, a, a single mother, she had, a, uh, she had an 11 year old son who uh, was diagnosed with uh, leukemia. And he went from a very healthy boy to a very sickly boy to a very sick boy. And they ran a bunch of tests. And uh, they, needless to say, they found that uh, the youngster needed a, a, bone, a bone marrow uh, transplant. Uh, it came as a big surprise when I got a telephone call from the hospital asking me that uh, if I was interested in uh, being uh, tested for um, this uh, particular thing, if I was interested in uh, being a bone marrow donor. And uh, originally I was not, but then I asked, well, what is this concern? Uh, this concerns a young a young man between age uh, 10 and 11. I said, okay, let's talk. What are we talking about here? So they said, well, your, your blood match is uh, perfect, but we have to test other factors to see if you're compatible. And uh, needless to say, uh, I turned out to be uh, compatible. I was very happy to find out sometime later that uh, the uh, bone marrow uh, transplant was uh, not uh, just simply successful. But the very last I heard back at the time, his leukemia went into a complete remission. And that was a very, um, that was a very, a very rewarding uh, feeling. I remember when you were, when, when you went through all that and you had said at the time that it was the most painful experience as far as physical pain that you've ever had. And I, I knew somebody else that had went through something like that. And they, they said the same thing. They said, there's nothing they could think of that was more painful. So that act of kindness, that compassion, that showing that humanity, that was something I, I still remember from that specific uh, meeting when you were talking about it in front of the in front of the crowd there about what you were doing. And, and it just it, it blew me away then. It still blows me away to this day because a lot of people um, wouldn't do that, especially for somebody that was a complete stranger. It just shows the type of uh, character I think that you have. And, and uh, uh, you're just an incredible human being. Well, it, well, basically, Jeff, I have to explain that Going through what I went through as a, a child, as an adolescent, even as a young adult, uh, I know what it's like to be caught in a bind, to be in a real mess and have nobody to, uh, to reach out to, nobody to listen to you, nobody to help you, things of that nature. I know what it was all about to be all alone, uh, especially as a child. And from that point forward, I, I, could, I could not turn my back on a stray dog or a stray cat when you come right down to it if it needed help. And needless to say, if a child needs help, especially a child, unfortunately, I never could be one to say no. I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty much like that with, um, with adults also, except that the difference between the way I was then and the way I am now is that whenever I have to, um, you know, when I'm compelled to help somebody out who's really a bit down on their luck, it uh, it gives me a lump in my throat and a teary eye because uh, I know what that feeling is all about. I know just how bad it hurts. I know the fear of it. And I I might be I might be a physically tough guy, but I know what it's like to be afraid. Believe me, I'm very well. I'm not exactly unacquainted with fear because uh, I went through an awful lot of abuse as a young kid, and uh, these things just don't leave. In fact, th that in actuality. And I would not need a psychologist to tell me that was one of the things that actually um, prompted me to, uh, to to build my body so strong, to be resistant to the beatings I used to take when I was a young kid. 
And to this very, see, to this very day, I, I still, I still have that uh, trauma. When I say I still have that trauma, uh, even Catherine asks me from time to time, why am I still uh, training the way I do? Why am I still pumping that heavy iron? Why am I doing all these different things like I'm still in competition? The fact is, if I don't keep my body strong, I don't feel safe. It's as simple as that. I just simply do not feel unprotected. I feel like I'm going into a battle without armor. And my my physical fitness uh, contributes to my uh, sense of uh, security. And despite it all, I was never I was never a bully. I never pushed anybody around. I never took advantage of anyone. In fact, I'll tell you something. I can't stand any anyone with a bullying nature. Really, the only thing I want to do is just land him a right cross because I mean, <laughs> because of all that all that all I've had had to endure. Yes, I I do have a very protective streak. I, you definitely, because he gives them the eye, this look like somebody comes too close to me that not supposed to be near me, and he said, "Don't even think about it." Well, with his eyes. Well, look at it this way: that's that's the only advantage that I have in most cases is having a face that you would expect to see on an Indian's totem pole. Because <laughs> sometimes I get the screaming fans mm -hmm. and and the fans that are frightening. So I tell Duke, I said, that person, you know, I have a sixth sense. I don't like the way he's looking at me. Mm -hmm. So I grab him, you know. Oh, yeah. So they, they didn't call him the pit bull for nothing is what you're saying. No. <laughs> well, Jeff, I could tell you, I could tell you stories about that. In fact, you know, it, would, it, it wasn't, it wasn't me. That gave me that name. It was a doctor from the New York State Athletic Commission, basically, who gave me that nickname. Mm -hmm. Because we had, a, basically, you know, just tell you very quickly. Now, I got uh, this big, this big overgrown jerk. He pulled it, pulled his a, a chain out of his uh, coveralls during a match, and he hauled off and hit me right in the face with it, and he broke my nose. So I pulled a chain out of his hand, and I pushed him into the corner, and I worked him over like a speed bag. When they got into the locker room, the, the commission doctor looks at him, and he says, it looks like a pit bull tore into him. <laughs> and uh, the promoter comes in over there and says, yeah. He says, you're right, doc. That's pretty much what it was. <laughs> it was a pit bull. <laughs> That's what I've been calling <laughs> me ever since. I tell most people they call me the pit bull because I can't afford to eat anything other than dog biscuits. Oh no! <laughs> oh, <come on. laughs> no, I think Catherine takes pretty good care of you. So. She takes excellent care of me. <laughs> Believe me, she takes excellent care of me. She's a great cook. She's very, uh, you know, she's very health conscious. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't, say, I can't say enough about it. She's never cooked me a bad meal, and they're all healthy. See. Can't beat that. Can't beat that. <laughs> I don't even try. I do have a quick question for Catherine, actually. Okay. Now, obviously, when you first met Duke and everything, he was your bodyguard and all of that. Now, when he was in the movement, you were aware that he was in the movement. Is that correct? Yes. Or were, Yes. And yet, yes. you still showed him kindness, and you still fell in love with him. Definitely. And you you know, I I believe I remember you talking about either when we talked before or another time, but how when he would go on the trips for the movement and for the NSM, you would pray for him and pray. Oh for yes, him. I did. Can you tell? Us I prayed for him that nothing happens to him, and, and Jeff Scoop too. I had him in my mind also, to so protect both of them. See, that is incredible to me because here you are, you know, praying for two individuals that, you know, espouse another ideology that doesn't like other races other than, you know, their own. Mm -hmm. And here you are, you had enough compassion and empathy Thank to care about these people. Definitely. And that speaks wonders to me. It That's really, really the way I am. That is awesome. Now, when Even when Jeff Scoop was making speeches, I still wrote it for him. You know, I said, he's going to be okay. They bring him home, too. Right? Yeah. See, yeah. That's see she, only one time, there was only one time that she had asked me uh, about uh, Jeff back uh, when I was um, when I was his uh, chief of security. 
And I told her, I said, well, look, you see what you see on TV. You're seeing what you're seeing on these uh, DVDs. Okay, and you're listening to him speak. But I also want you to know something else. You're talking about a family man here. You're talking about a man who loves his children. You're talking about a man who basically reads them bedtime stories before they go to sleep. You're talking about a guy who basically puts all his basic responsibilities ahead of everything, including um, political uh, matters. He's an educated man. He's a very well-spoken man. And uh, he happens to be very good uh, company also. And uh, I don't say this simply because I'm his bodyguard. I say this because in a short space of time, I got to know him and I got to know him very well. And that's when she started putting two and two together and coming up with four. And she saw that uh, despite everything, there's an awful lot of goodness over here in uh, the, you know, this guy. And that's yeah, why she... he's down to earth, kind hearted person. You can tell by looking at him. He's, he's down to earth with everybody. You know, you can't help but love him. See, it's better. I've always said it's better. You guys are too kind, way too kind. <laughs> no, it's true. You're like you see, family to us. You see, Jeff, I tell people to this, mm -hmm. to this very day, I still tell people to this very day where I work and everywhere else, I would rather have people dislike me. I would rather have them even hate me for telling them the truth and what's really on my mind than have them hate me, disrespect me, and mistrust me because they know that I'm lying to them. It's that's my personal uh, opinion of um, how one should actually uh, behave, how somebody should really represent himself. You know, at least wise, tell the truth. Don't tell any lies. And I tell this to everybody. You may not like what I tell you, but I'm not going to lie to you. It, it's just uh, that that simple. They may hate you, but oddly enough, they'll still respect and trust you because they know that there's no deception in you. Right. I agree with that. That's a hundred percent. And and I think what's, what's really going to be interesting to a lot of the people that get a chance to watch or, or listen to this program is the, and the reason why I was talking about some of the, we were talking about some of the things that you had done in the past and how, how we interacted back then and, and just the complexities of, of even the relationships that we had during the time in the movement and, and after and how that changed is a lot of times I think people look at at people that are in the movement and they go, you know, these people are just scum. They just they look at those that are involved and I'm talking about the general public, not people like us, but um, that are out. But before, you know, when we were in, there was a lot of people in society that would just say these are just evil people doing bad things. So I thought it was really important to note about how you did that uh, bone marrow uh, trans uh, transfer to that uh, uh, young young person that you didn't even really know. And some of these different things that that took place to show that humanity, to show that that, you know, not everybody that's in these things is inherently evil or bad that, you know, we took we made some wrong choices, obviously, um, we could have done other things, but um, you know, that there's more complexities to this to kind of show that humanity. And it was, it was the love of, of your current wife too, that helped you to see the humanity of others beyond, you know, beyond our trapped circle or our trapped behind the barriers, basically. Um, so I, I think, I mean, if you have any thoughts on that. Well, you know, like I say, everything, every experience in life is a very serious learning experience. Uh, I really, I really didn't get to uh, learn all that I had until I uh, completed 20 years with the uh, correction department. When I joined the department, it's true, I did take note of the fact that the majority of um, inmates are uh, minority and the smallest percentage are uh, Caucasian. So, of course, that uh, basically uh, uh, mark uh, regarding minorities. But by the same token, the majority of good officers that I worked with were also of a minority nature. So I can't say that um, crime is in their genes because it really isn't. It's all a part of uh, the environment that they've come from, their upbringing, things of that nature. Does it have anything to do with their, uh, their color, religion, background, or anything like that? It simply has to do with the, the environment that they're reared in. I've seen a lot of uh, a, a lot of negative um, characters who were occasion too, and some of them were worse than my 
but not because automatically because I was a white officer. They expected me to take sides with them against everybody else. And they were rather upset when I told them, I said, hey, listen, does it matter the slightest where you come from, what your color is, or what your history is? You're on that side of the gate, and I'm on this side of the gate. You're I'm wearing a uniform. Get used to it. You're, you're, you're an inmate, and I'm an officer. So don't try to pull that right white brother nonsense on me. Uh, when I uh, joined the movement, it didn't really have altogether as much to do with hate as it had to do with um, my resentment for a double standard that um, our judicial system has uh, put together, and they have in. Uh, See, it had a lot to do with my frustrations as a um, as an officer, seeing all the injustice that was going on. Basically, how how why is it that they have more of a concern for these uh, criminals than they do for the victims? Why is it that there's no assistance granted to the victims, and in the meantime, once someone gets arrested for a class A felony, they automatically get a, a, a free of charge lawyer for them to defend them? These, is, these were some of the things that really bothered me, and these were some of the things that I really wanted to see a change to. In addition, uh, illegal aliens from every country, not just Mexico, but everywhere here, getting jobs that are being denied our uh, regular unionized uh, employees. Basically, what does it come right down to? Dollars and cents. When you can pay an illegal foreigner popcorn wages over a $35 to $40 uh, at four, our uh, wage to a plumber, a mason, a steel worker, a carpenter. Well, why not pay the illegal guy? Because you're going to be paying him a, he a heck of a lot less, and you're going to be saving a fortune in the process through embezzlement, of course. So you're and, basically what you're saying is that your your trajectory into the movement had more to do with the politics rather than anything to do with race. Is that, that's what I'm hearing? Precisely. I, I, I confess that, and uh, it's it's something from time to time that I know definitely showed through during uh, meetings, talks, things of that nature. But like I say, I could re I could resent a, a, a chronic felony offender who's my own color, than hold contempt for a black man who's supporting his family, going to church every Sunday, loves his wife, loves his family, staying out of trouble, and just can't seem to get out of a, uh, out of a bad environment. I'd have more respect for that black man than I do for that white criminal. And, and God knows there are plenty of them. What advice would you guys have? Um, either one of you could take this question, but what advice would you have for other people that are, um, as you know, with, with Beyond Barriers, there's a lot of people that reach out to us. Some of them are on the fence um, in the movement and they're, they're kind of trying to make decisions on should they stay, should they, should they leave? Um, what advice would you have for, for anybody that's, that's working right now, struggling, trying to change their life or that has left and they're thinking about maybe looking back at the movement, you know, they're, they're still on the fence about different things. And, you know, what advice would you have for those, those kind of people? Like how, how has your, obviously your know, life has, has changed a lot, but how, what advice would you have for them? Well, you see, it's a, this is a very uh, difficult matter because we've all been through it at one point in time or another. Anyone who has any kind of a profound interest in getting involved or getting reinvolved should first speak to someone who has been involved and has left, like yourself, me, a few other people who we've talked about. Speak with them and get it directly from them, and they'll give you all, every reason why not to. You may give one good reason why you should. They can give 10 reasons as to why you should not, and they'll compound those reasons. You see, if I was an alcoholic, which thank God I, I've, I've never been. I wouldn't want to go to some uh, academically taught classroom trained poindexter who's never had a drop of alcohol lecturing me on what to do about my problem. I want to go directly to a recovered alcoholic who's been there and done that and who can show me the way because they've experienced it all. And it's much the same with, uh, as I say, with anyone who's ever been involved in any type of um, 
a hate group, any any form of white power movement, any neo-Nazi organization, anything like that, who've gotten in, who've been there and have gotten out of their own choice, let that person speak with them and they'll get much better direction. So um, your, both of your story about when, like, when you had the, the cancer and all that was going on, uh, Catherine, how did you, how did you feel when you, when you had heard the news from, from Duke that, um, you know, that he had this cancer and, and uh, how did, how did that affect you? I, I, I know the story, but I, I want the listening audience to hear it. It's, it's I of, prayed for him and I've told him that everything's going to be okay because it's the higher power looking out for him. That's a, you know, he's going to erase that cancer from his body. So you got to look to a higher power. Well, well, it's like so many other things, uh, Jeff. It's, uh, you know, seeing was believing. The surgeon originally who examined me told me straight out, this is, you have to, uh, you have to have to get, uh, get, get this thing surgically removed immediately. You have an eight centimeter tumor in your throat, which is radiating with cancer. And this is like, you know, like Monopoly. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. Got to go directly in, got to get this removed along with your thyroid gland. So I'm saying, you know, look, I'll do anything that, I'll do anything that'll keep me from dying of cancer. The pastor that I've, uh, that I've come to be uh, friends with and all actually made a trip into Brooklyn to have a long talk with me about things. And at the time he had no idea that I was involved, not only involved in the uh, Nazi movement, but that I was a high ranking officer. And that really hit him as a shock. And I explained everything to him. And of course he, he was the only one that gave me any form of encouragement. He was the only one that made me feel that I really had a chance because at this stage of the game, you know, he, you know, he's telling me, he says, listen, cancer doesn't have the last word. God does. And he, this man, this man did not talk about religion. He didn't discuss religion. That guy talked about God. It's as simple as that. And he pointed out a number of things that I wasn't even aware of. Well, he went to the um, went to, to the hospital with uh, Catherine and me that Tuesday morning when they operated, and he hung around and saw to it that I came out okay. But chances are, I don't know if I would have been so well lucky. See, two days prior at uh, services. It was a it was hands on prayer at, at, at the altar and the entire congregation had gotten up and they applied hands. And I remember him uh, praying out loud, you know, God to curse this tumor and make it shrivel. Well, surprise, uh, you know, surprises of all surprises. Uh, soon after um, they brought me into uh, recovery, the surgeon comes out of the um, OR and says to me, well, you'll be very happy to know that we inspect, you know, we checked thoroughly all your lymph nodes. They're all 100% perfect. You're going to be okay. Just give yourself a chance to heal and you'll be just fine. Just, but just give yourself a chance to heal. You won't need chemotherapy and you won't need radiation. Now that was a, let me tell you, that was a joy in itself. That was when I took Catherine's hand and I, and I said to her, I said, you know something? As soon as I get my strength back, I'm going to marry you. Mm -hmm. And uh, she would, she was just as happy as I was. That was after they kicked them out uh, of the hospital. She stayed at the hospital all night long. She slept in my bed. And he, and he was in the chair sleep. Well, he wasn't actually asleep. So everybody else in the recovery was sleeping but him. So he, he got up with the drainage tubes in his neck like Frankenstein. He got up. And he's doing knee bends and exercising with the tubes. That's a my goodness. <laughs> I, can, I can picture this. I can I can picture that happening. <laughs> well, 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 Jeff, you know you know me better than a lot of other people, and you know I got a little bit of a show off streak in me. So of course, oh, really? the, so the the, nur the nurse the nurses even got fed up and disgusted, telling me to uh, get, get, if you don't get back get, in get bed, in bed. Get they got the doctor. They got the doctor who was on that night to come up there and talk to me. And he says to me, he says, listen, Mr. Snyder, if you do not go to bed, we're going to have to sedate you. So I just told him in a very nice way, in a very gentlemanly way, I said, well, listen, doctor, 
if you're going to look to give me anything, it either better be a hero sandwich, a pizza, or a, or a candy bar, because who's ever going to try to give it to me is only going to wind up eating it. It's as simple as that. As a please, I feel good, and I want to be I want to be left alone. It's looking, well, where's the strength coming from? I said, well, there's only one way to find out. You got to ask Samson where he got his strength from. <laughs> I said, I'm getting, I, I, I get mine from the same department store. You know, he's carrying on. He said, your thyroid gland has been removed. Your throat is all stitched up. You're, you're, you're all wired up, you know, with tubes and everything. Where's the strength coming from? I said, hey, don't look a gift to us in the mouth. I'm feeling good. Just, <laughs> just let, let it all go with that. And the following day, they did, in fact, throw me out of the hospital. After he went looking for the doctor. The doctor was hiding from him. I told him, I want somebody to sign me out. I want to go home. I feel good. I want to go home and have a steak for crying out. So everybody was staring at him when he walked to the nurse's station with his gown and everything on to confront the nurses and where the doctor's at. Now, the bottom line was I figured the only way, the only way I'm going to get results in this hospital is by putting on a show. I'm going to, I'm going to, do, I'm going to do a little grandstanding. So I said to the nurse, I said, ma'am, listen, I'm not mad at you. You're not responsible for any of this nonsense. I want to get signed out. Now, I'm telling you, look, ma'am, they operated on my throat yesterday. I grant you that. It's clear. It's clear to see. But there's nothing wrong with these meat hooks. And if I have to go looking for that doctor, this hospital is going to have one more patient because he's going to wind up becoming his own client. I said, now, I want to go home. Two minutes later, they got another doctor to sign me out. They packed my bags, walked me to the elevator, took me downstairs, and took me right to the front entrance. And I'm saying to myself, <laughs> uh, this is definitely my lucky day. <laughs> so they don't want to see me again. We, we don't usually have so much excitement on this show and, and all, all these kind of heroics, but I, I can picture this in the hospital, you know, the showman coming out and and uh and doing uh, doing all these things i can envision it that's why it's even i'm laughing even harder than i should be probably <laughs> i gotta try to make a copy of the comedy show that i did for cable when and yeah. um, he was in it too and um really? he was dressed like a cop so i was civilian and the scene you see me walking with the cop and um he goes he goes to the door it's like I'm supposed to be escorting her home, and but it turns out she's escorting me to the police station. For, for, you know, she, she's there for my protection. Yeah, so he said, well, little lady, this is where, where you and I part company. He said, thanks for walking with me. He looked out the door, looked both ways, and then slammed it. I said, it's up to us citizens to protect our local police officers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, that rule applies today. Right. Yeah. Yes. It Most does. unfortunately, yeah, it doesn't. That, that does apply to that. But you know, all in all, getting back to something, you know, switching gears. Mm -hmm. Being with Catherine at the time also taught me a lot of other things too. And I found it very difficult to believe until I became an eyewitness that there's still a lot of oppression taking place in this country regarding um, uh, black uh, citizens, because she was a single black woman. And her job wasn't even giving her uh, medical coverage. She she couldn't get proper medical attention. She was being taken advantage of, um, and uh, she was basically living. She was lived, living hand to mouth. She's working. She's uh, paying her taxes, paying her bills, and yet uh, she was uh, she, she she was in total poverty. When you come right down to it, there was no reason for it. And yes, it's, even though I didn't uh, give off any indication. Uh, my heart, my heart was breaking for her. And when her building got condemned, and she couldn't find housing anywhere, then you know, really, I just, uh, I, I couldn't control my passions at that point. And I told her, I said, "Listen, give it a week. If you can't find some other lodging somewhere which is befitting, I'll move some stuff out of one of the rooms I have up here in my house, and uh, I'll move you in there. At least you'll have a place to sleep." So. Um, that definitely, um, you yeah, know, that definitely worked to an advantage. Uh, one, you know, the day she moved in, from what I understand, I heard this from my daughter first, and this was another thing that really caught me, like a kick in the throat. Uh, she comes in the house, sits down. She's so relaxed, being that she's in a uh, house rather than a small room and in a, and in a neighborhood where you don't hear gunshots, and she went to boil herself a cup of tea and she fell asleep in the living room waiting for it. 
So all the water boiled out of the tea kettle and it melted the plastic uh, top. So she took notice of that. The first thing she tried to do was clean it up. And when she couldn't clean it up, she goes downstairs and knocks on my daughter's door and uh, shows her the thing. And the uh, kid says, well, that's, that, that can be replaced. That's, uh, that's nothing. But she said, but I, but I damaged your father's property. When he comes home, is he going to beat me? He because said, uh, because of what I've been through with this other jerk. He used to beat me every day. I just wanted to know, am I going to beat her? Is that, is that what, yeah, one, yeah, that'll one be the day, day I raise my hands. He said he was going to cut me and my kids up with us in the garbage. Oh, wow. Yeah, and like I told you, the day I, uh, the day I will cover, you know, told you I, I'll cover your back, mm -hmm. remember? No, definitely. I, I told you point blank. I said, mm -hmm. well, that's one thing you don't have to worry about again. No, because definitely. he will never put his hands on you again, no, no matter what. I know. I said, don't you worry about it. He'll have to raise his hands to me first. No. And, and if he does, that's when he'll find both his hands broken up to his shoulder blades. <laughs> yeah, that's it, right? Yeah, it would not be in his best interest to, to raise no. his hands. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> <It'd be an laughs> that says a lot. And it, it, it shows, um, having been in abusive marriage and relationships myself, like I can totally understand, Catherine, like where you were coming from. You're like, you know, you know, Duke, Duke's told you that, you know, he'll protect you and stuff, but that's still in the back of your mind because of what you've been through. And it, it's sad that that's how that is. But on a bright note, you know that you're with a man now that would never, ever do anything like that to you himself and would never allow that to happen Definitely. to you, ever. And no. that's, that's awesome. Well, that's really well, awesome. Well, Acacia, I was very gratified when I got an email from uh, her oldest son when he found out that uh, she and I had gotten married. And he sent me an email and he told me, he says, you know, at least he says, I'm very happy that my, that I, knowing that my mother is in safe hands. And then another one of her sons sent me one saying, thanks for loving our mother. And, you know, it's, it's funny though, because, you know, you walk into something, granted, Got married, and one of the side benefits was I got four more grown sons and 16 grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. And I got one grandson upstate, upstate in Albany who makes up for 16 grandchildren <laughs> all, 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 all on his lonesome. Oh, wow. This kid, oh, this kid's a trip. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, the first time I saw him, he was just an infant. And uh, I even said back then, I said, this guy is really going to be something else. Wait, <laughs> wait till he gets a little older. I can see it already. I can mm -hmm. already, I can see the mischief already. So the kid, the boy's name is uh, James, and since he's the wild Indian of the family, I started calling him Geronimo James. <laughs> That's awesome. But I'll tell you something. I, I, I love to see wild, healthy kids because they're healthy. When you come right down to it. There are some parents, there are some very unfortunate parents who only wish that their kids can run around the house and get into things and knock things over and all that stuff because the children are not uh, physically uh, well. And I just, you know, like I said, I just, I, I love see, you know, I love seeing health, healthy, wild, energetic kids. And I love hearing happy children. You know, it's, uh, I know it, it, it's part of my basic, um, uh, emotional makeup, you know, it makes me feel good. Absolutely. Uh, I was just going to say another thing that, that is, is so enjoyable. I, I think about being, being out, you know, and being out of the movement, we, seeing old friends like, like yourself and that have changed their lives as well. And, you know, we, we don't say people's names because we keep all that confidential and things like that, but there are so many, there's so many people from our old lives that are out and that are doing so well now. And it's, it's such a, it's such a joy to be able to see, to see that. I, I mean, I would have never, I guess I shouldn't say I shouldn't have expected to see you again, but I, I know when, when you left the movement and you, and you were straight up with, with me, I was still in at the time, obviously. And, and you said, this is what happened. And you, and you told me everything, basically what was going on at the time. And, and we remained friends, even, even when I, I was still in, you know, you were out, but we remained friends and we didn't talk all the time, but you know, here and there we touched base and, and, uh, I thought, I thought that was pretty incredible. Just looking back that, uh, when friendships can transcend those boundaries and you can remain in contact with people, it's sort of like, uh, uh, 
you know, maybe this was our destiny to, to do the good works and, and the things that we do now. But I just want to thank you as, you know, man to man as, and as a friend, both of you really, but, um, you know, for being a friend all those years. Mm -hmm. Well, well, see, Jeff, there's hardly any greater camaraderie that takes place among men than people who have actually been involved in situations where they really had to cover one another's back, where they had to protect one another's lives, things of that nature. Uh, soldiers are like that. In fact, when it comes to law enforcement, uh, certain, uh, no, no levity intended, but there are partners, you know, uh, in the uh, law, you know, in law enforcement agencies who actually form a stronger bond or a stronger relationship than a man and his wife do. When you come right down to it, because everything they get involved in, they get involved in jointly and have to look out for one another. And uh, I was, I was proud. I mean, I was definitely proud to uh, be placed in uh, charge of your personal protection. And I meant every word that I said in Los Angeles that time when word got out that um, I believe it was MS-13 was going to shoot you once you got down to the um, rally uh, point. And I did, I did say, in fact, well, if they want to shoot him, they're going to have to shoot me first because today I'm walking in front of him instead of beside him. And I don't mind telling you, faced by a similar situation today, I would do the same thing. I would do the same thing because loyal, loyalty has not died. Yeah, it's, uh, we, we're definitely uh, brothers, man. And, and uh, I got your back the same way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and Catherine, I appreciate it. I mean, it's, 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 it's incredible. It really is. Uh, and, and Catherine, I wanted to ask you what, uh, so when you were, you were falling in love with Duke and, and you'd stood by him all during all this time. And uh, I, I feel like love is something that transcends just about anything. And I think your story, your and Duke's story is so incredible. And that's why it's, it's so uh, wonderful to have you on the program. I mean, what advice would you have for for anyone that's out there that that's uh, looking for love or or advice? Uh, what what you would tell them? Because you guys' story is just so incredible. What what message would you have for the world on that? Um, tell them to um, for, uh, you know believe in the Lord, you know, because He does answer prayers, and you know, be good and um, be kind gentle with people treat people the way you like to be treated mm. and don't worry about what the person look like on the outside that the love the person has love in their heart and have you know don't forget um, don't worry about their appearance love the person no matter what size they are i'm not worrying about the haters that hate me i know i know you're gonna, you're gonna those are great. Those are great i know stories. a lot of people because because when somebody was watching a video of me and duke from um, a love story, I had a lot of haters. People that, that said, um, uh, they going to bulk me from my race. Let, let's talk about that. So there was this really <laughs> wonderful documentary that was done on you guys. And, and what was it called again, Catherine? Could you tell love us Story. Okay. It was it was a CNN uh, love story. And uh, uh, we were, like I said, we, we, were, we were interviewed. And uh, it was... Uh, put over, uh, you know, uh, CNN, and it's true. We got it for every one positive remark that somebody said, there were three negative ones. And this was only to be anticipated when you come right down to it, because we all know the way people really are. Um, you know, the, the, the resentment, well, all I can say is if someone is going to go so far out of their way to show this type of resentment towards people that they don't even know, then obviously they have a very unfulfilled life. Exactly, exactly. And you know, um, that's that's the exact same thing. I don't know if I was saying it to Acacia the other day or or someone else, but I said, you know, when people go out of their way, because I, I get that too, I get, we get hate mail and, and different things like that, and people saying negative things, and I know you guys do as well. Um, 
it's because they're that unhappy. Why, if, if someone is that unhappy that they're going to take time out of their day to email or call or somebody, especially somebody they don't know, or even if they do know you, but especially if they don't know you, that's kind of weird, you know, like that. I mean, if you think about it, it's really strange Like they must be that unhappy. So instead of uh, getting angry about things like that, now I feel more sorry for those people, you know, because their lives must really be miserable if, if they're taking time out to do that. So don't let that stuff get to you. And, and for anybody else yeah. out there that's listening, you know, just tune those people out because they their lives are not very good. That's that's why they do no. that. Yeah, because one time I was on the bus coming home from work and some a, a lady made a racist comment to me because I was wearing a German shirt. And the lady said, she's a racist. Yeah, she was wearing something regarding the uh, the German, um, you know, involvement in the, uh, you know, the, the, the Olympics. Mm -hmm. You know, that's all it really was. Mm -hmm. Nothing more, that, nothing less. It was totally innocent. And uh, because uh, she was a black woman wearing something that has to do with uh, Germany, right away there's resentment. And she no. said, oh, she's a racist. Yeah. That's a yeah. See, see that, that's the narrow-minded, short-sighted approach to everything, simply because you're recognizing another country as uh, being um, successful. Automatically, you hate everybody else. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, my, my it's father, not true. My father spoke German. Well, your father was a Marine who did two tours. He mm -hmm. served he served one uh, during, uh, you know, you know, in Japan during the Second World War mm -hmm. and then again in Germany after the occupation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he this guy was, very good. you know, I mean, that this guy was a decorated Marine. He was tough and he was smart. You know? In fact, she tells me that if he came across me when I was a little boy and knowing the kind of abuse I was going through, he would have taken me off the street and he would have brought me home. Mm-hmm. And I told her, I said, well, I'm sorry that I didn't meet your parents when I was a young kid, because mm -hmm. chances are I might have avoided an awful lot of trouble mm -hmm. if they didn't raise me. Because right. yeah. oddly, we grew up in the same neighborhood, but we never saw each other. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah, yeah, he grew up in Brownsville. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the Bronx. No, you were in Brownsville. But I, but you, I lived you, in Brownsville. You lived in Brownsville for quite some time. No, but I mean, this may seem racist to me, but I would not even get out the car to get a cup of coffee in Brownsville. Look, that's a high crime area. It has no, nothing, to do. It has to, nothing do. to do. It's not a question of being racist. It's okay. a question of being cautious. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. It's neighbor, a, those neighborhoods are terrible. That's all. It's a high crime neighborhood mm -hmm. right now. I mean, I wouldn't even walk down the block over there without something happening. So really, the, you feeling the way you do, it's not so strange. The police even feel that way. Mm -hmm. Even 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 police feel that way. They don't want to patrol that area. So uh, don't don't feel so strange. It's not it's not a racist thing. Mm -hmm. See, you know, once again, talk about uh, race relations and stuff. You know, the idea or thought of an interracial relationship for me had never occurred. I never once considered it. I never once thought about it. Uh, I do remember once as a young boy, uh, my, uh, my father, my father was very, uh, he was very biased. He was very racial biased. It, he, uh, everything with him had to do with discipline, strength, power, fearlessness, you know, things of that nature. That's always the thing that he tried to impress upon me. But one afternoon we're sitting on the uh, porch outside the house and this black woman is walking down the block cuts the you know cuts across the street in front of us and walks into the building that you just moved into and he's talking to me and he says no he says look he says that there's that's an attractive looking woman right there he says look at the way she she dresses real nice she's got her hair real you know real nice and uh the way she's carrying herself he says, and, I'm, and i'm saying to myself for a guy who basically doesn't like any uh, nationality or color other than his own it's surprising to hear him say something complimentary about a black woman. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that just uh, stuck with me. I guess uh, I guess it, it was always there, but it was always repressed as well. Uh, me personally, I never really I never felt I never felt any type of a racial bias when you come right down to it. Um, I just I couldn't bring myself to hate someone or some people who never did anything to hurt me personally or anything of that nature. I mean, it, uh, if it became a personal confrontation, well, needless to say, uh, you know, hey, let's go for it. But if, um, if it's an instant party, 
then you know it I, I just couldn't bring myself I confess I tried but it just wasn't there it just was not a part of me and and uh, I, I believe you 100% on that because I remember when we were together in the movement, I don't remember, you know, there's different people, as you know, there's there's ones that are in there um, that really aren't that racist, you know, um, there's racism there, obviously, but that's not their driving factor. It's the politics or it's it's a single issue. There's There's many different reasons or trajectories for people. And then there's some people in there that are just insanely racist, that they just hate everybody. And, and, and you and I have both met those, but I don't recall any any time ever hearing a racial epithet out of your mouth, even even back in those days, you know? Yeah. So I, I believe it 100%. And it, that's why this is so complex. Um, life is so complex and there's, you can't just label people and put them in a box and, mm -hmm. and you're so right. Like uh, love transcends any color, any religion, all these, all these different things. And, and, um, I wish the world could see it. I, I, I it's, it's, uh, it's an incredible thing. So is the, the illusion of strength that the movement gave off this, uh, hyper-masculine environment. Is that something that attracted you to the movement? Is you know, it, it's it's so strange. I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat something that I've repeated many times back when uh, when I was in the SS, and I explained that that no uniform, decorations, medals, or collar insignias can glorify a man. The man must glorify those objects. Mm. He has got to be a person who's worthy of these things. When you come right down to it, a position of power. I mean, I've, I've moved up the ladder pretty quick. A position of power. I never saw any kind of a promotion as a as a, a, a move up in power. That was a bigger responsibility. I learned as a corrections officer. Now, corrections is not like police, because the first thing they do when they put you in a prison is you're in charge of a a massive amount of criminals right there. And uh, they'll uh, they'll escape at any given opportunity, or they'll stab you in the throat at any given opportunity. And I had to deal with this environment for twenty years, and I learned dealing with criminals, regardless of uh, what what who or what they are. You uh, you have got to if you're five foot seven, you better stand six foot seven. You could be tough as nails, but you don't have to be mean. There's always a way of getting a point through without necessarily being mean. And I've, I've proven my point over and over again. You know, being a man who's nowhere near six foot tall, I had to prove myself on my very first day on the job. And I've never raised my voice. I never used a four letter word. I have never made a threat. I never did anything like that. I didn't try to show myself up as a tough guy. But I did let them know, however, don't raise your hands. Just do not raise your hands because it will not benefit you in any way. It, in fact, it, it, it may lead to your demise. So as, a, as an officer in charge of what I was in charge with in the NSM, once again, I'm dealing with uh, manpower, but I'm dealing with manpower on a much different level. But it's still a question of delegating authority without necessarily being abusive. And I've never, I had never, under any circumstances, have had abused anyone. In fact, you know, as J. Jeff would recall, if there was anyone among us that had something on their mind, something bothering them, a critical issue or something, I was always a person who would take them aside and say, "Listen, I may not have a solution for you." But I'm willing to listen if you want to talk. And if you want to talk, you've got my full attention. Okay? And if you want me to keep it in confidence, we're going to keep it in confidence. You know, when we were in uh, Missouri, I remember I was sitting in, a, uh, in the lounge area of the hotel speaking to a young uh, female NSM member. And we sat there at the table talking for about two solid hours. And right away, the first impression was she just broke up with her fiance, who was a stormtrooper. And there we are talking. And everybody's of the opinion, uh, it looks to me like uh, Sergeant Snyder over there is going to look to move into this other guy's spot. They were very surprised to see 
this, uh, you know, this woman and her uh, former fiance sitting at the breakfast table the next morning talking because I was sitting there all that time trying to talk to her and convince her to reconcile with the fella and, and uh, you know, get, uh, you know, get reinvolved. And I was very happy when it all worked out that way. You know, people, you know, they judge too much by appearance. And that was the first impression that they got. But that was definitely not my intention whatsoever. I was very happy, in fact, when everything worked out for the better. But like I say, that's that's pretty much the way I am. It's the way I've always been. You know, I, maybe I'm a maybe I'm a frustrated um, social worker or guidance counselor or something. I really don't know. But uh, if, uh, like I say, somebody somebody has an issue, I'm always willing to sit and listen to them. Predominantly, I imagine because I never had anyone to listen to me. I was always alone. Wow. And that's, I that's, mean, go ahead. Well, you know, bad experiences sometimes can either make a person uh, crazy or it can push the pendulum in the opposite direction. And uh, I've mentioned once before, like my parents, well, let them, well, let them both rest in peace. They didn't set an example of what to be as parents. They set an excellent example of what, not to be as parents. And fortunately, very fortunately, I raised three good kids, never got in trouble, never had a problem with drugs or alcohol or anything. And, uh, you know, then Catherine, God bless her, she became a single parent and she raised four good, solid men, four good men, one of them being, being an, an ordained pastor. Can't say anything bad about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You definitely can't say anything bad there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's strange, you know, I'm, I'm approaching, I'm approaching 71, 71 years of age. And we, we are still at my hand raised. We are still on our honeymoon. <laughs> and we don't argue about nothing. No, we talk. We don't yeah. argue. We talk. We have yeah, discussions. No disagreements. Uh, we can have a disagreement here. Going with the we, cat. But we talk about it. We <laughs> do not argue about it. Right. I want to thank you both for coming on the program. It was it was amazing. It was, it was so good to see you both. Is there anything that you guys uh, have in closing that you'd like to close off? Anytime at all. We're very grateful for the for the opportunity to uh, speak. We're very very grateful in uh, gen in general, and believe me, I'm a guy that's got an awful lot to be grateful for. You know, and uh, I I, uh, I leave this parting note. I say this: I'm going to be 71 on my next birthday, and if I got anything to say about it, I'm going to live another 71 years after. after that. And I'm going to be 66 in August. Oh, you look <laughs> amazing! You look amazing. Thank you so much, you guys, for joining with us.